welcome to another episode of Untold Legends, where we explore the stories found within the worlds of video games, movies, comic books, and anything in between. Before we get started, this video is sponsored by World of Tanks, the free-to-play PC tank battle experience. I highly recommend you give World of Tanks a go. Being able to choose between 11 nations on 30-plus maps inspired by actual real-world locations and multiple game modes to play on, World of Tanks has plenty of content to dive into, and more importantly, it's a ton of fun. I spent most of my weekend getting into random tank battles, trying to prove my military superiority and destroying my enemies, and I got absolutely hooked to earning upgrades for my tanks, which were fully customizable, from weapons to gear to appearances. And anyone that's familiar with this channel knows I love customization options and spend way too much time on them. Make sure you click on the link in the description of this video to check out the game, and if it's your first time registering for it, use code TANKTASTIC to earn 7 premium days, a premium tier 3 tank, the Soviet at T-127, and 500 gold. Get in those tanks and drive into battle. There are too many of them. There are too many of them. Fall back. Uh, wait, what? Never. Real gamers never back down. Uh, if I go down, I'm going down in a blaze of glory. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Reverse, reverse. Oh, man. In Chapter 1 of the Resident Evil timeline City of the Dead 2.0, Raccoon City, one of the Umbrella Corporation's most valuable assets, suffered a T-virus outbreak due to the actions of rogue Umbrella scientist William Birkin. As the infection spread and the undead completely overtook the city, a group of survivors worked together from location to location to survive the nightmare and use the subway system in an attempt to find a safe way out of the city. And as Umbrella's UBCS mercenary forces began undertaking missions and the military evacuated, Jill Valentine began a fight for survival when Umbrella's newest weapon, the Nemesis T-Type variant Tyrant, targeted her, ending with a final confrontation that left her infected and dying. As a reminder, here's the Canon Police Disclosure. This series is not intended to be a completely canon representation of the Resident Evil series. It's an alternate take on the events of Raccoon City, using various dates and events to streamline everything into a coherent story. In the late hours of September 29th, Carlos found Jill unconscious and contacted Tyrell to meet them at Spencer Memorial Hospital. If anyone knew how to save her life from the infection, it would be Dr. Bard. I... I'm taking her to the hospital. Maybe Dr. Bard can save her. All right, I'll meet you there. You hang in there, Super Cop. I got you. Carlos found no indication of survivors in the hospital. Days ago, it was filled with patients and medical workers barricading themselves from the monsters outside. Now only the undead remained, and Umbrella's bioweapons. There was little hope that Dr. Bard was still alive, especially with the hunter-type bioweapons rampaging through the hospital. More creatures Umbrella was using to analyze combat data. Carlos eventually came across Dr. Bard's location, but it was too late. Nikolai had gotten to him. Another target crossed off his list. Bard. Tyrell. Bard's dead. He's been shot. Shit. And the vaccine? I'm looking. Well, look harder. There's gotta be a computer, right? But there was still hope left to save Jill. After exploring Dr. Bard's office, Carlos came across a recording the doctor left behind in an attempt to restore some honor to his name. And I hope and pray, by making this recording and bringing the truth to light, that I can restore some small shred of honor to my name. All of Raccoon City's suffering began with the release of a biological weapon known as the T-Virus. My employer, the Umbrella Corporation, engineered this virus. 
and they ordered my team to develop a vaccine, which we did. Now, I keep samples of this vaccine here in my office. The rest of it is stored underground. But those sons of bitches at the board, they want to destroy it. They don't want the world to know what they've done. So they're trying to erase all evidence that the virus ever existed. No, I'm not a fool. I know they don't want me to... Carlos finally learned that Jill was right all along. The employer that had sent him into the city under the guise of rescuing civilians was behind everything. Dr. Bard stressed that a biological agent as powerful as the T-virus needed a treatment developed to cure it, but Umbrella was focused on covering up their own involvement, including destroying any treatment Dr. Bard created. But luckily, he hid a sample in his lab. Carlos now had the tools necessary to save Jill's life. The cure would take time to make its way through her body and clear out the infection completely. Earlier that afternoon, Raccoon City rookie police officer Leon S. Kennedy was preparing to begin his first shift. He hadn't been in Raccoon City since before the infection started, but when the outbreak began, he received a phone call warning him to stay away from the city. But after a breakup with his girlfriend and a night of heavy drinking, he was eager to begin his new life and find out why he was told to stay away. And Chris's sister Claire hadn't heard from her brother, his partner Jill, or any of his fellow STARS members in far too long. Something was clearly wrong. She jumped on her motorcycle and decided to check on him herself. With communications from within Raccoon City blocked, nobody on the outside knew what was actually happening, besides being told of a minor chemical spill. There was no military blocking the roads anymore, and the city was left to its fate, while higher-ups in the government discussed other solutions. They had to decide quickly before the infection continued spreading, since the infected had already started wandering just outside of city limits. Even truckers traveling through the area fell victim. Just before entering the city, Leon stopped at a nearby gas station to fill up his vehicle and immediately felt something wasn't normal. The pumps were still open and available for use, but nobody was around, and blood soaked the floor. Moments before he arrived, Arclay County Sheriff Daniel Cortini responded to a call from the gas station and found himself in a fight for his life, a fight that he was quickly losing, and Leon discovered the aftermath before making his way inside city limits. You all right? Don't move. I'll be back for you. Stop moving. Officer, you need help? Uh, stay back, sir. I got you. Hey! Freeze! I'll shoot!
You all right? Yeah, I think so. Thanks. You can thank me later, when we're safe. Come on! Get in! Hold on. Leon and Claire drove into the city together with the goal of reaching the police station. They had never seen anything like Raccoon City. The streets were devoid of life and the people seen walking in the distance were the same monsters that attacked them at the gas station. If anyone had answers, they would be in the police department where Leon was employed, and Claire believed Chris would be there, but there was no way through in a vehicle. The streets were filled with debris and barricades originally placed there by the Raccoon Police Department. Oh my god, this is so unreal. Police station's not much farther. They'll know something. Yeah, but what if we're the only ones? What if there's no survivors? No, there's survivors. It's a big city. There has to be. Looks like we're walking from here. Luckily, Leon and Claire both survived the crash, but were separated by the infected and a wall of flames. They agreed to meet at the police station and were forced to navigate the streets of Raccoon City alone. Leon's location was the closest to the police station and he made his way inside. Just like the rest of the city, he found the station with nobody in sight. After checking the lobby computer, he discovered live footage of another survivor somewhere in the station. Officer Elliot Edward was being attacked. He was following Officer Rita Phillips' example of escaping through the many possible secret passageways found within the station. Leon had to help him before it was too late and crawled under the shutter to reach him. On the other side of the building, the power was mostly out, and it looked like there was a massacre. Whatever happened inside the station over the last couple of days was surely the result of the undead overtaking it. Throughout the hallway, Leon could hear Officer Elliot screaming for help. Help me! I got you. Give me your other hand. Officer Elliot's screams of pain as he was mauled to death attracted the infected outside and Leon rushed back to the lobby, where the open area held some semblance of safety. He rushed to open the shutter and crawl underneath it, when Officer Marvin Branagh, still alive inside the station, rescued him as Leon struggled to catch his breath. His first day on the job and he just witnessed a man being eaten in half as he held him. You're safe for now. Thanks. 
Marvin Brana. Leon Kennedy. There was another officer I, I couldn't... I couldn't... Here. <clears throat> I'm sure you did what you could, Leon. Does anyone know what started this? Not a clue. But honestly, all you need to know is that this place will eat you alive if you aren't careful. Yeah, well, I was supposed to start last week, and I got a call to stay away. I wish I'd come here sooner. You're here now, Leon. That's all that matters. We can get you to a hospital. No, no, I am not the priority here. Lieutenant, I'm not just gonna leave you here. I'm giving you an order, rookie! You save yourself first. I'd come with you, but I'd just slow you down. If you see one of those things, uniform or not, you do not hesitate. You take it out. Or you run. Got it? Yes, sir. <laughs> Leon set out to find a way to escape the police station. He begged Marvin to come with him, but the bite from Brad on an open wound infected him. He was succumbing quickly to the T-virus strain and forced Leon to survive without him. Earlier, Officer Rita Phillips had used the passageway hidden by the lobby statue to escape the police station, but the way was closed and Leon had to find a way to open it. The station was filled with secret hidden tunnels with multiple routes leading out of the station. Leon's first day on the job was expected to be a fresh start for him. The rest of the police department had even planned a surprise welcoming party for him. The new life he wanted to begin was now simply a dream. Just outside, Claire had survived the streets and made her way to the police station to catch up with Leon. When she arrived, she discovered the gate inside was locked and looked for an alternate way inside. Marvin was in the lobby monitoring the station's cameras and called Leon over to get some help. Take a look. <laughs> yes! I knew she'd make it. Oh, you know her? Yeah. Name's Claire. I came into town with her. You can get to that courtyard. Through the second floor. East side. <laughs> I'm on it. Thanks, Lieutenant. Officer Marvin was a selfless hero. He could feel the virus taking over his body and wanted to do everything in his power to ensure that he could help Leon and any survivors escape with their lives and let the outside world know what happened to the city. Leon made his way over to Claire's location, hoping that she was still there waiting as an infected helicopter pilot lost consciousness while attempting to escape the city. I'll be right there. Okay. Claire. It's so nice to see you. Yeah. Any luck with your brother? No, not yet. Claire, don't lose hope. I'm sure we're gonna find him. Damn it. You need to go. Now. Okay. Let's get through this. Both of us. The sound of the crash attracted a horde of infected to the station, and Claire had to find another route inside. She didn't have any police training as Leon or any STARS members did, but Chris was the only family member she had left, and he made sure that she knew how to take care of herself. After searching outside, Claire found a key that unlocked the gate inside and stepped into the police station. She witnessed the same horrors that Leon discovered when he first arrived, and the horde of undead were making their way inside in large numbers through the station's broken windows. She had no idea what part of the station Leon was currently in, but her main priority at the moment was to find the star's office and any clues that would give her answers about her brother. Leon was on the other side of the station in the armory preparing for any other threats he encountered. Zombies weren't the only type of creatures inside. The station was also crawling with liquors looking to pick off any survivors. Leon also discovered several tokens that fit into the base of the lobby statue and it activated an intricate mechanism that opened the way underground. He hoped this would give him a way out and attempted to convince Officer Marvin to come with him. Lieutenant Branna! Marvin! It's time to go. Hey, Marvin. <sighs> we need to get you to a hospital right now. No, no, I... Uh... 
Save yourself. Come on, I've got you. Go! Look, we can still make it out of here together. Just can... It's too late. I tried, Leon. But I couldn't stop it. We can't let this thing spread. It's on you now. Just go! I understand. I won't let you down, Marvin. Marvin knew it was too late for himself and refused to put Leon in danger. He would succumb to the virus alone, but satisfied with the knowledge that he played his part to help Leon escape. Claire was able to locate the star's office and search through Chris's desk and locker. She didn't find Chris, but found the letter he wrote to his fellow stars members. The letter Jill would have shared with Claire if she came looking for him, and Claire immediately knew something was wrong with the letter. She knew her brother well, and it didn't sound like him at all. It was obvious that Chris was hiding something and covering it as a European vacation. This does not sound like Chris. Claire left the star's office and discovered the passageway underground that Leon opened. Once Claire reached the underground, she was hoping to find Leon, but instead of finding him, she found someone quite smaller, alone and afraid. Uh, I won't budge. Hello? Hey. It's okay. I won't hurt you, I promise. Do you need help? Here, you can take my hand. She's right behind you. What? Claire had come across William Birkin, still mutating from his exposure to the G-Virus. By this point, his humanity was mostly gone, and all that remained was a rampaging monster. Unknown to Claire, the little girl she just found was Sherry Birkin, the daughter of Annette and William Birkin. But the two Umbrella scientists cared more about their work than they ever did their own daughter's safety. Sherry was left alone often to take care of herself, and during the outbreak, she hid inside the police station for safety. Mom is down here? I think so. I hope so. Yeah. Of course. I'll help you. Claire couldn't leave a little girl by herself in the chaos of Raccoon City and took her with her. Sherry was familiar with the police station since her parents had Police Chief Irons on Umbrella's payroll, so she had visited the station quite a bit, and Sherry led Claire to the parking garage where there was an exit. And you're sure this is the way? This is how my mom took me last time. Sherry? I've been looking everywhere for you, Sherry. Brave little girl, leave your house in the middle of this mess. On the ground, hands behind your head. You can't be serious. On the ground, now. Sherry, tie her hands. You tie her up now, or she dies. <laughs> What are you going to 
do to her. None of your fucking business. You heard her, I swear to God, my brother is stars, and I will fuck her. Sherry, get over here. What's your fucking name? Claire! Sherry, you come with me now, or say goodbye to Claire. Okay, okay, I'll go. You better be taking me to my mom. Absolutely. Don't listen to him, he's shit. Stop hurting her, please! Don't tell me how to do my job. Stop! Let me go! Let me go! Obviously, nobody talks you matter. We'll fix that. Go or yes, we will. Let me go! Let me go! I'll get you, you fucker! Police Chief Irons took Sherry. At this point during the outbreak, he had completely lost his mind. His paranoia that he was infected had completely overtaken him, and with his poor leadership, he ensured the Raccoon City Police Department's downfall. Irons believed that Sherry held something of great value that he needed, the pendant that Sherry dropped, which was now in Claire's possession. She had to find another way out and made her way back into the police station. Not far behind her, Leon had arrived in the same parking garage and realized that the virus didn't just mutate humans. Damn. Need a key card. You gotta be kidding me. Get off of me! Hey! Stay sharp! Lower it. FBI. Sorry. Thank you. For your help. FBI, huh? What's going on here? Sorry. That information's classified. Where are you going? Do yourself a favor. Stop asking questions and get the hell out of here. Leon's life was saved by the mysterious Ada Wong, a young woman that claimed to be an FBI agent on a classified mission in Raccoon City. As quickly as she appeared, she disappeared, leaving Leon to wonder who she was. Near the parking garage, Leon found the holding cells where people originally jailed by the police department had turned, but he found a survivor in Ben Bertolucci, the reporter that was originally investigating Chief Irons. I don't believe it. A real human. <laughs> Hello, human. You have been here long? Long enough. Are we the last ones alive? No, no, there's a few of us. Huh. That's good news, I guess. Yeah. That's of course Irons sent you. Irons? You mean Chief Irons? Is he still around? Who cares? Hopefully he's somebody's dinner by now. What do you mean by that? He's the bastard that locked me in here. I'm sure he had a good reason. He did. I was about to blow the whistle on his dirty ass. Unlock this cell and I'll give you this. There's no other way out of that parking garage. Believe me. Sorry. I can't do that. I have to talk to the chief first. Look, we're both prisoners in the station. So either we play nice and help each other out. Shit. What's coming? What? What's coming? Come on. Just get me the fuck out of here! Who is that? It's just me. So you can put that thing away. I, I don't even know what happened. It just happened so quick. I told you to get out of here. You wouldn't want to end up like Ben, would you? You knew him? He was an informant. Had information of use to my investigation. So what he said was true? Ben Bertolucci was dead, a target of Umbrella on a hit list that was programmed into the mind of one of their T-103 tyrants. Huge, almost unstoppable bioweapons, mass manufactured on Umbrella's Sheena Island. Umbrella deployed them in Raccoon City to destroy any threats that could expose them, and soon Leon would come into full contact with the terrifying beast. Having seen him inside the police station, Leon became a target of the tyrant and the bioweapon tracked him relentlessly. Jesus Christ! 
Anytime Leon damaged him enough to down him, he would eventually rise back up. It seemed that the tyrant was almost invincible, and Leon had no choice but to continue running. With this monster rampaging in the area, Leon knew that Marvin would be in danger, and went to warn him, but it was far too late for him. Marvin! Oh no. Damn it. <laughs> I'll stop this, Lieutenant. I promise. Back in Chief Irons' office, Claire's investigation led her to a small room, where Chief Irons had a key card for the parking garage, and suddenly a phone began ringing. It was Irons, furious after realizing that Sherry didn't have the pendant. Hello? Good to see you again, Claire. We've got unfinished business. What are you talking about? Don't waste my fucking time! Bring me the pendant, or Sherry dies. Pendant? What do you need it for? Do you want the girl to die? The orphanage. The orphanage? Where is that? In the neighborhood. You'll find it. Is Sherry all right? For now. I swear, you bastard, if you hurt her... Are you serious? Stupid kid. If you just hadn't dropped that fucking thing, I could let you go. Sherry found herself alone being held in an orphanage, a building in Raccoon City with its own dark history. Chief Irons was secretly the headmaster of the orphanage and used it to provide Umbrella with younger test subjects for years. When children were reported missing from the orphanage, he used his power as police chief to forge documents claiming they were adopted. Although Sherry didn't know it, the pendant she carried was extremely important. It was actually a key designed for use in William Birkin's lab that would unlock a chamber containing a G-Virus sample and a treatment for it. Irons believed that if he obtained the locket, he could use it to buy his way out of the city with Umbrella's help. Sherry also didn't realize the immense danger she was in. Irons was a very human monster, possibly worse than anything Umbrella could create. The outbreak had allowed him to give in to his darkest desires. For years, Irons had been accused with claims of violence and sexual assault. Though he denied them, the truth was much darker. In April of 1998, a secretary he hired found evidence of bribes provided by Umbrella, and he murdered her. And when the reporter, Ben Bertolucci, was investigating him, Irons discovered that Ben was dating the mayor's daughter, Catherine Warren. Irons was an associate of Mayor Michael Warren and had regular meetings with him to ensure Umbrella's secrets would be kept. And inside Irons' twisted mind, he became obsessed with the mayor's daughter. He locked up Ben to stop his investigation and to keep him away from her. And he spent many nights stalking the streets of Raccoon City, searching for women that resembled her. In August and September, a total of eight young women disappeared, and their bodies were never found. Irons had disposed of them to satisfy his own sadistic cravings. But when the outbreak began, the mayor fled the city and left his daughter in the chief's protective custody, an act that would ultimately seal her fate. Irons locked her away in the orphanage to do with her as he pleased, and he dreamed of turning her into one of his taxidermy trophies. Catherine found a weapon and attempted to escape when the city fell to the outbreak, but Irons locked the orphanage down and toyed with her by letting her run. Eventually, he ended his game and took her to his taxidermy room. In an effort to escape the orphanage, Sherry discovered Catherine's body and fought for her own life. Oh no, it's him. Where are you going, Sherry? I told you to stay put. You need to learn to listen. Leave me alone! Just please! Time to teach some manners. Uh. 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 You're gonna pay for this! Oh, uh, you little shit! I'm coming to you, Sherry!
unintentionally Sherry's father had saved her life. By now, he was simply a G-virus mutated monster that wanted nothing more than to reproduce by injecting G-larva inside the human body. Claire used the parking pass found inside Iron's office to open the parking garage shutter and closed it behind her. She looked through the orphanage desperately looking for Sherry and instead found Iron suffering from the effects of being implanted. Ah. Your fault! What? Took too long! What happened? Ah. Oh god! Ah. Get, get off me! Ah. Oh my god! Jesus Christ! Claire found the secret exit underground that Irons built into his torture room and found Sherry hiding below. Sherry. But William Birkin was still in the area, intent on reproducing further. Claire! Sherry! I'll be right there! Go, go, go! Claire! It's behind you! Don't stop! Hurry! Sherry, come on! Can you hear me? Claire? Claire, you have to get up. He's going to get us. Wake up! Wake up! Birkin caused the elevator to crash and Claire blacked out. For now, Sherry was on her own and Leon was able to reroute power to open the jail cell that was holding Ben. And Leon discovered evidence of Umbrella's activities that Ben was investigating. Yeah, but that doesn't explain the rumors about the orphanage. I, I just find it way too coincidental Umbrella is one of the benefactors. You told me this interview was about the new scholarship Umbrella set up. <laughs> Come on, that Nobody cares about that. They want to know about the G-Virus. Where did you hear about this? And a big fucking sinkhole in the city, which, by the way, rumor has it goes straight to your underground lab. Now, are yeah. you going to talk to me, or are you going to... This interview is over. <laughs> <laughs> Restoring power to the cells opened them all, and all the infected prisoners burst out, while the T-103 tyrant followed Leon. Leon took Ben's parking pass to reopen the parking garage and escape before the tyrant could get up. It was clear no weaponry he had available would take the monster down permanently. His only solution was escape. old. Saving your ass, that's twice. I didn't realize you were keeping score. Look, this isn't a game. Nothing dies down here. I take it you have the key card. Yeah, and this. I was hoping you could explain what's on it. Maybe. After I hear it. Let's get out of here. Ada saved his life again, and they decided to work together to escape. Leon still didn't trust Ada fully, but went along with the narrative that she was an FBI agent and shared Ben's tape with her. She claimed the tape wasn't enough evidence for her mission and needed more info to bring down the people responsible for the outbreak. Outside, Leon found an enormous hole where major construction was happening, more efforts by Umbrella to hide their activities. The only way through was Kendo's gun shop, and nearby they entered Kendo's gun shop that Jill had previously visited. Inside, Kendo revealed himself fiercely protecting his daughter from intruders that he didn't know. I'm not gonna hurt you. I said don't move. I'm just passing through. I'm gonna ask you to lower that weapon. I kill you one. You're gonna turn around and go right back out the way you came in. I think your daughter needs help, sir. Don't tell me how to deal with my daughter. Drop it. No! Wait! Step aside. We need to terminate her before she turns. It's my fucking daughter. Ada. Yeah. Just let them be. 
Daddy. They did to us. You're a cop. You're supposed to know something. How did this happen? Huh? She was our sweet little angel. Mommy. I'm sleeping, honey. Okay. And I'm gonna put you to bed too, okay? Mama. Just go. Just give us some privacy. You know, it's one thing to keep the truth from me, but why him? I want to find out what's happening here and stop whoever's behind it. Helping people like them? That's why I joined the force. My mission is to take down Umbrella's entire operation. We may not make it out. Whatever it takes to save this city, count me in. Kendo was forced to end his daughter's life with a single gunshot to avoid having to see her turn and sat in anguish next to her body. Leon and Ada continued underground into the sewers where Ben's tape claimed Umbrella had some sort of lab. And much like how Jill discovered earlier, the sewers were no safer than the surface was. Jesus! That an earthquake? Back in Kendo's gun shop, Kendo was preparing to take his own life. The pain from losing his daughter was more than he could bear. But at that exact moment, he received communication from his radio. It was his close friend from the STARS unit, Barry Burton. He knew something horrible was happening in Raccoon City and returned from Europe while Chris stayed behind investigating Umbrella. Using his connections, he secured a chopper and flew over the city trying to contact his friends to provide a way out. He saw the destruction below and couldn't get a hold of Brad or Jill. Barry believed they might not have survived the outbreak. And unknown to him, Brad was already dead, and Jill was unconscious in the hospital recovering from the infection. But he did receive word back from Kendo, and told him where to go for extraction. Kendo saw this as an opportunity to live for his daughter, and use his skills to fight against those that caused the outbreak. He armed himself with weapons he had left in his shop, and made his way through the streets to the location where Barry waited with the chopper. After several scrapes with death, Kendo arrived and evacuated from Raccoon City. After his escape, he would go on to help his X-Star's allies for years to come, by keeping them supplied and and continuing to create custom weapons for them. An unmentioned hero in a war that would last for years to come. Soon after Kendo's escape, Claire awoke from the elevator crash and met Sherry's mother, Annette. Open your eyes. Hold still. Not infected. Where's Sherry? Sherry. Sherry's fine. Do you know Sherry? It's an impressive display of strength. What happened to her? We have to assess the situation. Who are you? I'm Claire. I didn't foresee this. Excuse me. Where is she? Hello? What? Where oh, she? Annette. Tell me, what happened to William? I don't know. Who's, who is that? The creature responsible for this. What? Can you help me find Sherry? Seems to be evolving much faster than expected. Where are you going? Look, I don't have time to play 20 questions. Everything's under control. I need to find Sherry. My daughter is not your concern.
Claire was shocked that Sherry's mother was so uncaring. Instead of being concerned for her daughter, she was more focused on the skills of the monster that had just attacked them. If Annette wasn't concerned about Sherry's safety, Claire would take over as her protector, and she set out to find her. Deep in the sewers that Umbrella used to hide many of their worst secrets, and she found Sherry speaking with her mother. collapsed and Claire rushed to find a way to the girl. When Birkin attacked Irons in the orphanage, he was able to infect Sherry with a parasite, and the G infection was spreading through her body. The sewers were an incredibly dangerous area. They were infested with G-infected tumorous growths that spawned G-mutants in their embryos. The mutated G-forms were powerful but slow-moving, able to withstand multiple rounds of gunfire, but the power of flames could quickly eat away at them. But something much more monstrous lurked in the sewers. As Claire got closer to Sherry, William Birkin reappeared stronger and further mutated than the last time Claire faced him. She can't be saved. Are you fucking kidding me? You're her mother. Get in here! You don't understand. William is still out there, and if I don't stop him... This conversation is over! Wait! Wait! I, I can treat her. In my lab. It's not far away. Mom, you can't... There's not enough time. Millions of lives are at stake. Sherry, mommy loves you, sweetie. Goodbye. Are you fucking kidding me? Sherry, don't worry. I will get you whatever you need, okay? Oh, why are you doing this? Because I care. <laughs> Annette revealed that the laboratory she worked in had a treatment that could potentially save Sherry, and Claire carried her to the cable car connected to Nest, the underground facility Birkin was originally attacked in by USS forces. As the night went on, Sherry was in incredible pain while the infection was spreading, and Claire gave her a jacket to comfort her. Claire and Sherry arrived at the Nest facility, and Claire laid Sherry down in one of the side rooms where she'd be comfortable for the time being. Claire promised to return soon to take care of her, and she began investigating the facility to find the cure. Okay. Um. There you go. All right. Now what? Um. Huh. There's got to be something here. Antiviral agent. That's it. That's got to be it. Hmm. Hey. Hey, Sherry. I gotta go. You stay right here, though, okay? 
I'll be back soon. I promise. And Leon was still making his way through the underground with Ada. Something big was down there with them, and he could feel the sewer shaking when it passed by. Ugh. You sure this is the right way? Unfortunately. Wait there. Chew on that, son of a bitch. The giant infected alligator was destroyed, and Ada finally explained that Umbrella was behind everything. She continued her charade that she was an FBI agent trying to bring them down, and explained that Umbrella was in the market of selling the viruses that created these monsters to interested parties. One of Ada's targets was Annette Birkin, and she found her just below. Definitely William's handiwork. Identify yourself. Annette Birkin. She's who we're looking for? Not much time. Need to dispose of it. We're here for the G-Virus. Huh. That's not gonna happen. I'm warning you, Doctor. Oh, yeah? Hey! Stop! I didn't expect that from a scientist. Uh, Leon. Forget about me. Just go. Stop her before she gets away. Ugh. Leon was wounded with a gunshot in the altercation. Ada bandaged his wound and received orders to continue searching for a G-Virus sample, even if it meant heading directly into Nest. She left Leon to rest and headed out to find Annette. Ada fully expected obstacles in her path to keep her from reaching Annette and had equipment ready to disable the electronic systems underground that blocked the path. But what she didn't expect was the T-103 Tyrant. Somehow the monster followed their trail underground and Ada ran for her life, ending up in one of Annette's traps. Bravo. Gonna burn me alive now. You'll never get your filthy hands on the G. I'm not the only one after it. You realize that. And you won't die alone. Thanks to her equipment, Ada was able to override the incinerator systems and barely escaped with her life. Annette knew that Ada wasn't who she was painting herself to be, and refused to hand over a sample of the G-Virus. You lost. Tell me, is your husband still alive? Or did you kill him so you could take credit for G? Interesting theory. You don't cooperate? I'll get a sample from the nest. Over my dead body. Where's Leon when I need him? 
Leon woke up to find that he was alone. He wasn't sure how much time had passed, but Ada was nowhere to be seen, and he left to find her. He found her in the waste disposal area bleeding from a piece of shrapnel embedded in her leg. Ada had collapsed from her wound, and Leon traversed the dangerous passageways of the sewers and faced the same horrifying monsters Claire had to deal with. Ada tended to Leon's wound while he was injured, so he would return the favor. Ada! Ada, where are you? Over here! Ada. I was getting worried there for a sec. I can't get it out. I, I don't know if I should, uh... Just do it. I can't walk like this. Okay. It's gonna hurt. I can do it myself. Just relax, okay? Get yourself out of here. While well, you still can. I'm not just gonna leave you. You're not getting rid of me that easy. You protected me. Now it's my turn. I didn't realize we were keeping score. Grab my shoulder. Oh, don't push it, rookie. Okay, I'm just trying to help. You want to help? We have to get to the nest. Nest? Umbrella's lab, right beneath us. Annette let it slip. That's where the virus samples are. Ada made it seem as if Annette had told her about Birkin's underground nest lab, although she already had the knowledge, and made it clear that was their next destination. After seeing the horror that Umbrella was causing with their actions, Leon was determined to gather the evidence needed to bring them down, even if it meant traveling into the heart of their secret lab. Ada continued to manipulate him every step of the way by taking advantage of his emotions and his need to do the right thing. Hey, Leon, trust me? trust me? Honestly, if I didn't, you'd probably be dead. Right. If you can secure the G-Virus, I can make sure what happened in Raccoon City never happens again. Ada, you say it yourself. It's a federal case. I Leon, don't have the authority. look at me. I'm a liability now. I'm not just going to leave you here. What if you're attacked? What if you need help? I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. I gotta see this through. And I want to see you again. I got plenty to live for, trust me. Now, arriving at Nest. Go. For your safety, stand clear until the doors are fully open. For your safety, Welcome to Nest. Enjoy your visit. September 30th, 1998. As a new day started in the early morning hours after midnight, Carlos waited for Jill to recover, and Tyrell made it to the hospital, with information that Carlos needed to see immediately. Tyrell, what the hell happened? Attention all citizens. The contagion spreading throughout the city has been designated uncontainable. On October 1st, Raccoon City will be completely destroyed in a missile strike. All residents capable of rational thought are urged to evacuate immediately. This is not a test. Attention all citizens. I mean, that's only a day away. There's still people in the city. You think Uncle Sam gives a shit? Fuck. Here they come. Oh, you sit tight. I got this. Better grab some gear. The U.S. government made the decision that the viral outbreak was uncontrollable and Raccoon City could not be saved. The entire city, including the survivors left inside of it, would be destroyed. Survival was now a race against time. Just outside Jill's recovery room, an enormous horde of infected were breaking into the hospital, and Carlos barricaded the door to protect Jill and Tyrell. Carlos unloaded everything he had, pumping bullet after bullet into the zombies coming inside until the power could be successfully restored and the hospital shutters could be activated.
vaccine's the real deal. Good. You going somewhere? You're damn right. What do you think you're gonna do? Whole city's about to be microwaved. Come on, man. Call the government. Tell them we found a cure. You stall for time. Ballsy motherfucker. The cure was working on Jill, and her condition was clearly improving. Carlos left to continue searching the area, while Tyrell stayed behind attempting to contact the government and stop the attack on Raccoon City. If he can get through and let them know there was a cure, there was a chance he could save the city. Underneath the city, Claire continued searching Nest for a G-Virus treatment and discovered the extent of Umbrella's activities. They were experimenting on all sorts of living creatures, including plants. Plant 43 was genetically engineered, created with the T-Virus. In the chaos of the outbreak, it became aggressive and attacked the scientists in Nest's greenhouse area, infecting many with its seedlings and creating ivy zombies. Irregular mutations that were incredibly deadly but vulnerable to fire. To continue going deeper into the lab, Claire needed the wristband of the scientist being held by Plant 43's vines, and she used directions she discovered to synthesize an herbicide that could kill it. Dispensing solution now. With the wristband in hand, Claire was able to access the portion of the lab where the Birkins did much of their G-Virus observations, and used Sherry's locket to open the chamber containing the antiviral agent that could treat Sherry's G-Virus infection. God damn it. Oh, look at that. All right. Hell yeah. Got it. The antiviral agent. Gotta get back to Sherry. At the same time, Leon was on the other side of the lab, burning his way through the ivy zombies, as the tyrant was hot on his trail. The monster had followed him all the way from the police station to the sewers, now all the way deep underground. Leon just needed to find a way to escape as soon as possible, with evidence of Umbrella's wrongdoing in hand. Eventually, he discovered the Birkin lab, and found a sample of the G-Virus there. Huh. That was easy. All right, now back to Ada. On the way out, he encountered a monster worse than the tyrant that was stalking him, the even further mutated form of William Birkin. Call this thing William. Why? It's Umbrella's fault, this whole mess. You're Umbrella too. You're telling me you weren't involved in this. Yes. But we never meant for this to happen. So you made this monster? We made the G-Virus, but we never intended this to happen. it any way you want. You're still responsible. <laughs>
tell me you'll destroy that G sample? No, it's evidence. It's going to the FBI. <laughs> you trust that bitch? What's that supposed to mean? She's not FBI. She's a mercenary. She's gonna sell it. If the G virus gets into the wrong hands. Annette collapsed from her wounds, and Leon believed there was nothing more he could do for her. Her injuries were severe, and he left to find Ada with the sample she was looking for. But Annette was still alive, barely, and made her way back to Sherry. She knew she hadn't been an adequate mother, and wanted to see her daughter one final time. She could die knowing that Sherry was saved from the infection, and in the care of Claire Redfield. <sighs> Annette? <sighs> Sherry. Or how are you? Okay. But you don't look so good. <laughs> Mommy? Hey. Did you look at the screen? <laughs> oh, thank God. So Sherry's gonna be all right? She'll be weak for a little while, but... Yes. She's free of the G-Virus. Did you hear that? Oh! <laughs> Take my daughter to safety. I'm sorry, Sherry. We can't just leave her here. You're right, we can't. Attention, unauthorized removal of a level four virus detected. What does that mean? It's a self destruct coat. <laughs> In case a G virus leaves the building, save my daughter. <laughs> Nest was armed with a self-destruct mechanism in case the G-Virus were ever removed from the facility. In the course of Leon and Claire's exploration of the lab, the mechanism was triggered and the entire structure would explode in a short time. Claire and Sherry rushed to take the elevator further down, and for the first time Claire realized the scale of the underground lab when she glimpsed the overloaded reactors. Leon was also making his escape just behind Claire and confronted Ada with her lies. She played off being an FBI agent, but she was clearly working for someone else that she kept secret. I was just thinking about you. That makes two of us. I was getting worried. Please, tell me you got it. Oh, I got it. We verify the G sample when we get the hell out of here. Before we do that, I ran into Annette. She claims you're not FBI. Why couldn't you just hand over the sample? As I realized, as much as I wanted to trust you, I didn't. So that's all this was. I was just some pawn to you. Look, I'm just doing my job. And I'm doing mine, so drop that damn gun! I'm taking you in. Yourself, Leon. No!
Ada seemingly fell to her death, and Leon lost the G-Virus sample, the biggest piece of evidence he had connecting Umbrella to what happened in Raccoon City. A couple of levels below, an operator in the Umbrella Security Service saw what happened and discovered the dropped G-Virus sample still intact in its unbreakable glass container. The USS member Jay Martinez, codenamed Ghost, was part of Hunk's Alpha team that was originally responsible for collecting the virus. During Birkin's attack, he was wounded, and he escaped from the sewers back into the lab. During the outbreak, he'd been searching for another sample, and he now had it. Now he just needed to escape the lab and call for extraction. With the self-destruct countdown continuing, he fought his way through the zombies attracted to the loud sounds. But Ada Wong was, in fact, not dead. A woman with her resources would not be so easily killed, and she was able to save herself from the fall. Just before he reached the tram leaving Nest, Ghost was ambushed by Ada, and she took the G-Virus sample before knocking him out and leaving him there. Her mission was a success. With only minutes to spare, Claire and Sherry found a train that they could use to escape the facility. Claire rushed to power it on and get it moving. She hadn't heard from Leon since the police station and hoped he made it out of the city already, but when she reactivated the power going to the train, she realized he was closer than she thought. Detonation. Who's that? Claire! Leon? You're down here too? Yeah. But the whole place is coming down. Listen to me. You need to get out. Fast. Yeah. I know. I found a way out. I think... I think we can all make it. Where are you now? Claire! Are you still there? Leon? Hey, Leon, you're breaking up. Don't worry about me. Just get out of here. Leon. Leon. Damn. Leon told her not to worry about him and leave, but communications between the two were breaking up. All the systems in the lab were failing. William Birkin's G-Virus made him a creature that could mutate further and further after each serious injury. It easily survived its encounter with Leon, and Claire was forced to fight him alone, while a terrified Sherry waited inside. While Claire was fighting Birkin, Leon was struggling to escape the tyrant. It was relentless in its pursuit, with the lab exploding around them. The monster sent Leon plummeting to the ground, and the tyrant was swallowed up by the fire. But even the fiery blast wasn't enough to take him out. It simply caused an injury severe enough to trigger a secondary mutation. The tyrant was now a super tyrant. Their suits also acted as power regulators meant to prevent them from mutating further. But now the tyrant was out of control. These would be Leon and Claire's final stands before finding an escape from the city. On her way out of the facility, Ada dropped a rocket launcher for Leon and rushed away, and Claire successfully stopped William Birkin. She rushed to the emergency exit train and hoped Leon would make it in time. If she waited any further, her and Sherry would be caught in the blast for sure. Leon made it just in time as the train was leaving and he jumped on, but one final obstacle stood in their way. William Birkin's G-Virus mutation had one last breath of life in it. Claire! Leon! It's so good to see you. I told you we'd make it, didn't I? <sighs> you did. Who's this? This? This is Sherry. Okay. 
Jesus. What was that? I don't know. You stay here with Sherry. I'm gonna go check it out. In the early morning hours, Leon and Claire successfully escaped Raccoon City with Sherry. After a night of pure terror, they were finally safe, and William Birkin's nest lab was completely destroyed. But the nightmare still wasn't over for some. That evening, another survivor made his way through the sewers. The USS Alpha Team leader, Hunk, had survived the initial assault, and was successful in retrieving a G-Virus sample when he went back for it. He had spent days running missions for Umbrella, covering up evidence of their wrongdoings for them, but Hunk was a soldier too valuable for Umbrella to leave behind. A man so skilled that he could survive any mission, and unquestionably performed any task they asked of him. It was time to get him out of Raccoon City before it was destroyed. Hunk fought his way through enormous amounts of infected in his way through the sewers and the police station. An extraction was waiting for him just outside its gates. to meet the Grim Reaper. In the final evening of Raccoon City, the downfall of Umbrella was beginning to be set in motion. A USS captain known as Rodriguez was planning to turn against Umbrella along with one of their researchers, a woman named Linda Baldwin. Rodriguez's entire unit had been killed and he'd been evacuating citizens from Raccoon City in order to have witnesses of the outbreak's true events. Together, Rodriguez, Linda, and other researchers that were colleagues of hers formed a plan to bring the company down by exposing them. But Linda had to return to her lab to grab a sample of an experimental drug that could slow the growth of the T-Virus. The Apple Inn and Jack's Bar survivors had discovered the lab after the subway they attempted to escape on lost power. They took refuge inside, and Linda offered them a helicopter ride out of the city if they helped her escape with the experimental drug. But it would be more difficult than expected. Shortly after, the facility went into lockdown as hunters began escaping their confinement, and the survivors were locked inside with them. To protect themselves, another researcher, Carter, reprogrammed a T-103 Tyrant to combat the hunters in the lab and unleashed it, assuming it was fully under control. Okay. I've reprogrammed it to take out those amphibian monstrosities instead. Bodyguard, but oh well. No need to worry. He knows who his masters are.
At first, the plan worked perfectly. The tyrant followed directions and fought the hunters alongside the survivors. But Umbrella's bioweapons were unpredictable creatures. It was only a matter of time before the tyrant rebelled against its master. Carter was the first to pay. Extraordinary. I told you, there is nothing to... anti-T-virus drug was destroyed by the tyrant, and Linda was injured down below. Now the only hope to expose Umbrella was to rescue Linda and get her to safety so she could tell the world what she knew. There were still some hunters left, but now the survivors had to contend with an out-of-control tyrant rampaging through the lab. Just like Leon had experienced, these tyrants would follow their targets non-stop until the mission was completed, and he chased them everywhere they went, as they fired back at it in return. October 1st, 1998. The survivors found Linda, and they learned how important it was for her to escape the city alive. Yo, you all right? Oh. 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 Wait, Carter. He, he didn't make it. My intuition was screaming at me to stop him from using that thing as some kind of a toy. Even the damn capsule got broken as well. What in the hell is that? Umbrella has been spreading a virus throughout the city. That little capsule contained what could have been the only possible cure to the virus. I ran a check on the capsule and basically know how to recreate a new version, but... None of that means a damn thing unless I can get my pretty little head out of here. Huh? David King, a skilled plumber and mechanic, took it upon himself to help escort her topside to her evacuation point where Rodriguez waited. But when they exited the sewers and appeared in front of the Apple Inn, Linda was shot in the leg. A UBCS soldier named Arnold thought she was one of the infected and he took the shot. Umbrella was making its final moves out of the city and was commanding its remaining UBCS forces under the supervision of an executive named Tommy Nielsen to move its experimental bioweapons to a safe location. And once Arnold discovered that Umbrella was planning to destroy Raccoon City and he hadn't been told, he was furious. Code double X. They plan to contain the incident the old-fashioned way. Oh. Blowing up the target location and everyone in it with missiles? Why didn't you say anything, you weasel? I, I kept telling you to hurry! Damn. Oh. Well, but where are you going? I'm not gonna go up in flames with the rest of the town. This job is turning out to be a lot hotter than I had expected. Hey, hey! Wait! Rodriguez also received notice that the government was planning to eradicate Raccoon City, and he was forced to leave Linda behind. He loaded up the cargo that Umbrella was trying to retrieve and flew away with it. It would be clear evidence of Umbrella's actions. But the Umbrella executive, Tommy, realized what Rodriguez was doing and caused the bioweapon to be unleashed. The monster Umbrella was hiding inside was the Nyx, a bioweapon that could absorb and integrate other life forms into its being. What the? 
David and the rest of the survivors helped the wounded Linda walk and reach the rooftops where she knew the UBCS had been deployed in the hopes that an escape route would be possible. Back at the lab, the survivors were tested and they had discovered the devastating truth. They were all infected with the T-virus and would eventually turn. One of the survivors, Dr. George Hamilton, discovered a letter in the Raccoon Police Department days ago from an old colleague of his from Raccoon University, Dr. Peter Jenkins. They were running out of time, and if there was a way to cure themselves, he believed Dr. Jenkins would have those answers. But first, they had to ensure Linda's safe exit from the city. When they reached the UBCS vehicles that were left behind, the tyrant that was following them revealed itself. Its power regulator had failed, and its super tyrant mutation was triggered. But the Nyx was far stronger and absorbed the tyrant. After Nyx was destroyed, they helped Linda into the vehicle, and she escaped, meeting Rodriguez outside. With their combined knowledge and the combined testimony of the civilians he escorted out of the city, Umbrella would be completely exposed. Although Linda had escaped, the other survivors made their way on foot to nearby Raccoon University in the hopes of a cure. Meanwhile, Umbrella researcher Greg Mueller, the same scientist responsible for suppressing Yoko and Alyssa's memories, was growing disgusted with Umbrella. They were so focused on mass-producing bioweapons and missing what he saw as the beauty of a single, perfect creation. He began his own preparations to turn against the company and let loose the Thanatos tyrant he helped develop from the body of Tyrone, a previous subject tested by Umbrella. Greg developed the Thanatos Tyrant, a unique specimen specifically engineered for efficient killing. Umbrella sent in their UBCS teams to retrieve or kill it, but the might of the creature was too much. Nikolai was monitoring it and used the opportunity to collect a blood sample for Wesker. One masterpiece is enough. Almost got him. Hold on. Calm down. You must give me your blood. Hey, something's wrong. Sir, let's regain our distance then. I won't underestimate it next time. The survivors arrived at the university and began their search for Dr. Hamilton's colleague, Peter Jenkins. But when they found him, he was already dead. He had previously made a partnership with Dr. Mueller, but when he discovered that he had played a part in the T-virus's development, he was shot in the head. Dr. Hamilton read through Peter's notes and discovered that he had detailed information about synthesizing a cure for the T-virus called Daylight a substance that would quickly wipe out T-virus infection from the blood, a moment of hope for the survivors. To create the cure, they needed several ingredients. P-Base, a liquid that was found in the water treatment plant below Raccoon University, V-Poison, a toxin created from wasps, and a blood sample from an organism completely infected with the T-virus. If all the ingredients were collected and combined, the daylight cure could be created. All they needed was the infected blood, and the Thanatos tyrant would be the key to retrieving it. The tyrant had made its way inside the university and was stalking them, but the survivor set an electric trap for it with enough voltage to knock it down for a moment and collect the sample. Uh. 
plan worked, and the final ingredient to daylight was obtained. With all three samples in place, they began synthesizing it. They waited for the machine to mix the ingredients together and encountered the man that released Thanatos, Dr. Mueller, one of Nikolai's targets. My apologies for this place being so hectic. I have been monitoring your progress from here. I am grateful for your assistance. Daylight is it. The only resource against the T-Virus. I cannot give it over to Umbrella. They're the ones responsible for the catastrophe which has befallen the city. In retrospect, that entire tea project was a total disaster. Brute force should not be the only criterion for a weapon. It must also be beautiful, unique, and godlike. You will also assist me. You're going to play with my ultimate creation. Farewell. Nikolai placed explosives in the university, and the survivors only had minutes to escape before the entire structure exploded. On the way out, they stopped to grab the daylight cure, but only a small amount had time to be synthesized. They grabbed the amount that they could, and left moments before the explosion. firefighters that were still alive in the city were circling the area searching for survivors, but it was too dangerous for them to land. When the survivors arrived in the courtyard, the Thanatos tyrant that was injured inside the university explosion reappeared stronger than ever. While they fought for their very survival against Thanatos, the infection in Jill's body was working its way out, and the resulting stress to her body caused her to have extremely vivid nightmares. Jill. Oh, thank God you're okay. I've got good news. It's over now. The city's safe. shit didn't that was all carlos he carried you here and he treated you himself crazy bastard where is he i went underground borrowed stockpiled the vaccine enough to give the city some hope he thinks he can do this by himself i'm going after him wait did you see the broadcast they're gonna blow the city sky high i'm trying to get a hold of someone anyone with the clearance to stop it leave this mess to him he's a professional so am i Jill was shocked at how long she was out and followed Carlos' trail to the hidden storage facility under the hospital, where Dr. Bard had secretly hidden another vaccine. Without a vaccine, the government would never agree to stop the missile strike coming to Raccoon City. 
Carlos was attempting to find it himself, and Jill found Nikolai alive and well, watching her through a window. He taunted her into following him, and she had to find enough fuses to fix the lift where he was located. When she arrived, Nikolai was gone, and she scrolled through the computer he was standing near. It was clear that he was sending messages to someone and typing in code to hide their identities. Nikolai was watching Jill and Nemesis interactions and reporting back to his superior. Unknown to Jill, Wesker was ordering Nikolai to continue testing Nemesis against her and watching her actions, and Tyrell received communication that the missile strike could be stopped. I got through. They're willing to negotiate. Ah. They'll call off the strike if, and this is one big ass if, we can deliver the vaccine to them before they launch. How long do we have? Hours, maybe. Then let's not waste one more second. Tyrell was killed by Nemesis, and Jill found herself in another Umbrella facility, their Nest 2 lab. While Birkin's Nest lab was used to develop the G-Virus, Nest 2 focused to gather bioweapon combat data. Over time, multiple people were abducted and forced to fight Umbrella's monsters to verify how useful they would be in combat. In its deepest levels under Nest 2, the lab had multiple different environments set up as different sets to confuse participants of their actual locations. There truly was never any hope of their escape. Nest 2 was also the facility where Dr. Bard kept the secret to synthesizing a vaccine for the G-Virus. Jill discovered the instructions to create the vaccine, but had to make it herself. There was no hidden stockpile. While searching for the components necessary, she realized the lab also served as a production facility for tyrants and hunters, and it contained scores of failed tyrant clones. Jill collected a test tube and antigen samples, and using the technology inside the labs, she was able to create the G-Virus vaccine, the key necessary to save Raccoon City from its fate. Synthesis complete. Please remove the vaccine canister. than I do. I don't think wisdom in trying to impart on you is getting through. Now I know you can't put a price on life. But I'm in this business to get paid. So let's make a deal. You go down there, battle the nemesis, and I'll record it all and sell the combat art. 
put on a good show and maybe I don't need a vaccine. Agreed? Good! Seemed that Nemesis had finally been destroyed and melted into a sludge. But the vaccine was gone, now in Nikolai's hands. Jill chased him before he could escape with the only hope for the city. October 2nd, 1998. Mere hours before sunrise and the planned Raccoon City attack. Ada Wong had made it out of Nest, but struggled to survive through the infected streets. She suffered several wounds and had bandaged herself up, fighting her way to the Apple Inn, where she planned to meet a contact from the organization she worked for. When she arrived, she discovered that her contact had killed himself, hopeless for a chance to escape, and her higher up in the organization made it clear that failure was not an option. Albert Wesker. See this? It's a tissue fragment with Birkin's G-Virus. Well, despite some setbacks, you have proven your value to us. Ada, there are two things you must be made aware of. One, in just moments, Raccoon City will be completely eradicated by a government-launched missile. And two, an umbrella officer will be leaving town in a helicopter. If you are not honored, there will be no way to leave Raccoon City. The G-Virus sample is required. Ada knew that Wesker only cared about people and things that he could manipulate for his own benefit, and the G-Virus was an extreme danger to the rest of the world. But at the same time, it was the cost of her escape, and without it, she would be left behind. Thankfully, she still had the sample she retrieved from the USS Soldier Ghost, removing it from the hands of Umbrella. Eventually, Ada climbed onto one of the freeways leading out of Raccoon City and encountered one of Umbrella's tyrants that military special forces had previously engaged, while the helicopter flew overhead for one way out. a short time remained before the military vaporized Raccoon City, and Jill was able to chase down Nikolai, but he had one final test for her, the ultimate final form of Nemesis. It's done. 
Give me the vaccine, you greedy son of a bitch. No, 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 no. You think money. I like money. This would be worth millions. But, uh, you know how it is. City's about to explode, and you can't put a price on life. <laughs> Good luck! Nikolai! Joe! Go after Nikolai. He's got the vaccine. What about you? We're running out of time. I've got this. Since Nest 2 was used to test the combat capabilities of bioweapons, Umbrella had developed the ferromagnetic infantry use next generation railgun, a portable railgun meant to eliminate the most powerful bioweapons in case of an outbreak. Nemesis was truly no more, one of Umbrella's most powerful tyrants, now another failed experiment. With Nemesis dead, Jill's only obstacle left was Nikolai. If there was any hope of stopping Raccoon's destruction, she had to take the vaccine from him. Reduce umbrella to rub. Ten minutes until missile impact. Ah, the missile has launched. stock for everything. Even letting the world burn. Who are you working for? I'll tell you. If you get me out of here. I'll pay you whatever you want. You're, You're a fool! If I die, 
As Jill and Carlos flew away, the smirk left Nikolai's face, and he realized that he was doomed. There wasn't enough time for him to escape the city, and they had taken the only helicopter in the area. The survivors fighting Thanatos near the university had spent the day being chased by it and struggling to survive, but ultimately wore it down enough for it to collapse. and the firefighters circling the city for survivors were able to track them down and return to them. But a tragic decision had to be made. There was only enough of the daylight cure for one person and one sample to mass produce. Only one of the survivors could escape to avoid the continued spread of the virus. The group decided that Dr. George Hamilton would be the one to escape. He had the medical knowledge to understand the virus and daylight cure and would be crucial in making sure it was mass produced. During the outbreak, he had gotten close to Cindy and they were forced to say their goodbyes. He left with the daylight and swore that his friend's sacrifices would not be in vain. David and Mark made a final stand against the undead. Escape's not for me. I'm a carrier. Jim and Kevin stood together and held the Thanatos Tyrant at bay, a monster that simply wouldn't stay down. I've stayed behind. I can't let the virus leave the city. I have to stay behind so I won't infect others. I get that. But to get stuck here with you, of all people! No. No way. See? Never a dull moment. Now, let's finish this like men. <sighs> Yoko and Alyssa stayed inside the university, and they used its computers to send the evidence they had against Umbrella to contacts that Alyssa had outside the city, information that would be later used against Umbrella in court. Even in death, the stories of the survivors would be heard, and Umbrella would pay for their crimes. My final contribution. We win, right? Sure. During the final minutes of Raccoon City, Ada was able to escape on the helicopter with the G-Virus sample. The helicopter was being piloted by Sergei Vladimir, the founder of the UBCS and one of Umbrella's highest ranking officers. He was extracting a computer core crucial to Umbrella's survival, containing a massive Umbrella archive and the AI Red Queen and her counterpart the White Queen. Ada hitched a ride on it and the end of Raccoon City had arrived.
Let's hit on the target, sir. Angel 1, both missiles are confirmed hits. Return to base immediately. This is Angel 1, roger that. Arrow 7 and 10, direct hits. Both Angel 2 and 3 have emptied their payloads. Arrow 5 correction, in hit coordinates. West, 0 0.5, south, 0 0.1. Roger. This is Angel 6 reporting. Confirms all fighters have emptied their payloads. Mission code double X complete. Repeat, mission code double X complete. This is Heaven's Gate. We got you loud and clear, Angel 6. Mission code double X is complete. All fighters return to base immediately. Roger that. Arrow 8, 11, target hit confirmation. On tonight's news with a heavy heart, we're reporting a tragic turn of events. In an emergency session, Congress and the President authorized a military strike on American soil. After days of unanswered questions and silence, Raccoon City has literally been wiped off the map, as evacuated citizens looked on. Current estimates place the death toll in the hundreds of thousands. Such extreme measures demand answers, but for now, our hearts go out to those poor civilians of Raccoon City and their families. After the destruction of Raccoon City, Jill kept the broken vaccine vial as a reminder of her failure, and prepared to join Chris and Barry in their fight against Umbrella. Leon and Claire were eventually rescued by military forces monitoring the area, and Leon was compelled to work for the American government. We have the authority to do as we please with you. You and that girl. Just leave her out of this. She's an innocent. An innocent who carries the G antibody. Don't worry. We're taking very good care of her. Bottom line is, you have the experience we're looking for. So if you want this to end peacefully, you really have only one choice. Work for us. As for Raccoon City itself, nothing was left. What was once a major American city was a series of craters locked down to contain any biohazardous waste, and a government research outpost was set up to catalog and research any surviving material discovered, ending the Resident Evil timeline City of the Dead 2.0. Yes, we'll be dropping two for each, beginning with sample T4. The rest will follow at 15 minute intervals. From here, you can continue to the Resident Evil Timeline Part 3, Umbrella's Downfall, where Umbrella's secrets are finally exposed to the world, and a series of accidents pushes the company closer and closer to the brink of collapse, and Albert Wesker reveals his survival, taking the steps necessary to bring Umbrella to its knees, while Leon begins his work with the US government to prevent another disaster. Since you made it to the end of this video, I assume you enjoyed it, so why don't you go ahead and smash that like button, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any new content. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, links in the description below. And if you'd like to support the channel, you can join my Patreon or become a channel member. This is Fabian, I love you guys, and I'll see you next time.